internal. And I wanted to talk to you about the best ways to use art and science to make a better world. And now to do that, I want to explain what I think a good way to think about art and science and like what they are in reality, how they relate to one another, and how they're different. And now art is, in my opinion, art is any way of expressing an internal, subjective, personal experience to someone else using sensory information. Sensory being any kind of medium, whether it's my physical body, moving around, doing things, speaking, singing songs, to, you know, media, to paper, to paint, to photographs, to um, movies and videos. So any kind of sensory media, any kind of sensory information that I'm expressing, that I'm outputting, is art. And as long as it's conveying my personal experience. So if I, I'm in an art gallery right now, and uh, there's origami in here. And origami is an interesting intersection of art and science. The art part of it is the fact that I'm in an art gallery, I come in here, I look at the things, and I experience emotions, I experience memories of my own experiences as they're sort of triggered by the art that I'm looking at. You know, I look at these things, I look at these objects and these shapes, um, you know, they started out as a flat piece of paper. I, I know this from my own memory, so I'm bringing my own experience to the art and adding them together. And the art is triggering my memories of my own experiences, and it's relating the artist's experience to my own, so I'm kind of sharing a same, the same subjective experience with someone else, or they're sharing it with me. And so this is art, this is taking some medium, some expressive sensory information, and using that to convey an experience. There are two things that that individuals can do in life, they're in the universe, they're, they're sort of two processes. There's taking in stuff, so all of the stuff that's experienced that comes into me, and then processing it in some unique way, and then outputting something. And so the, ex the art experience is taking in all the information from the universe that I've had, and then processing that in some unique way to output part of that experience in an emotionally connecting way, an, in, an individual to another individual. Uh, so heart to heart, you know. Uh, so this, this origami, you know, I come in here and I look at it and, and it conveys to me this experience that the artist had while they were making it. They took a flat piece of paper or some of these cases, there are many flat pieces of paper, but they, they started out with a flat piece of paper and they did things to it. They manipulated it, folded it, and twisted it, and turned it, and shaped it, and fit them together in a specific way. And then put that here. And so I had that experience of feeling a little bit like the artist felt. That they took in some information that they observed about the universe and they, they made a little thing representing that. It's like a metaphor, but in this case, it's a physical metaphor. So that's art. Art is this individual person to person, heart to heart, ex subjective experience sharing. And it's sensory, it's full of sensory information and robust. <laughs> it doesn't have to be extreme, it doesn't have to be like, crying or, you know, laughing hysterically or anger. It's just, you know, it's just an experience. The experience of taking a flat piece of paper and, and shaping it into something more interesting. Something, you know, that maybe represents something. In this case, there are, there's some flowers and there's some geometric shapes which maybe look like molecules or very tiny diatoms or something like that. And, and then there's some more specific shapes, like there's a, a 
rhinoceros or something in there and a, and a butterfly. You know, and, and those, so all of these, whatever the shape that they've chosen, models something in their experience that they want to share with someone else. And so that's the art part of it. And then the science, the other, the other process, these two forces, the art and the science forces that we have of interacting with the world, the science is a, is stepping back from the subjective, being objective, which I'll describe in a minute, by, you, you become objective by looking at other perspectives, by comparing different perspectives. So there's a perspective that's looking this way, and there's a perspective that's looking this way, and they're, they're contradictory. They're, they're seeing different things. They're going in different directions, but they intersect in some space. There's an intersection point where, where the two different perspectives, you know, there's, a, there's an individual over here looking at something and an individual over here looking at something. And at some point, their observations intersect. And where those things intersect, we can get an idea of an object. So there's a coin, let's say. This person sees heads, and this person sees tails. And they're looking at two different things and they're describing it in two opposite ways. They're, they're contradictory information, but they're both true. They're both completely honest about what they're experiencing. So this is subjective and this is subjective. But when you add it, when you step back and you look at two different other perspectives, you, can, you make this sort of triangle of understanding. So you're looking here and you're looking here and you're standing under these things and you're saying, okay, how do these, what are, where's the overlap? What are these people both experiencing? How can I figure out this, this thing in the middle? And what is that? So there's this understanding by comparing different perspectives. And that's science, and that's why the more perspectives we get, the more data points, the more uh, subjects we ask, the more, uh, the, the more broad and deep the data sets are, the more information we get. So let's say we want these people, we can ask these people to move around a little bit. So maybe they see a little bit more, maybe they, this one sees an edge over here, and this one sees an edge over here. And so they get the three-dimensionality of the object. They get a little bit more of a perspective um, if we move them around in space. So that can be, or we could add more individuals and get the same effect. So whether you're spreading things out breadth-wise and you're getting more deep amounts of information over time, it, it gives you a similar effect. And of, of course, the more of all of it, the more perspectives we get from all of the different directions over time, the better we're going to be able to model this thing that everybody is looking at. So this is science. And the science, the science is not an, it's not an outputting thing. People seem to think that science is facts and, and, and answers and solutions, but science is actually an observation, it's an input thing. Art is an output thing when you're making art, but when you're making science, when you're doing science, you're actually inputting information. You're collecting information, you're observing, you're asking questions, you're testing things out, you're doing experiments where you say, okay, now let's move, let's take two steps to the left. And so the people go, whoop, you know, and now what do you see? Now I describe this. And, or you, you do a control where you say, um, you know, let's say you look over here and you, you're both looking this way, but this one, you put on some rose-colored glasses, and this one you just have your regular eyesight. Uh, and now what do you see? And so you change the factors. Um, you say, you know, this is X and this is Y, you know. So you change the factors a little bit, but they're still looking at Z. So it's the same object, but they're still looking at the same thing. And you just change the factors and tweak things. And you compare everything. And then you see where the overlapping consensus is in the middle. And the consensus isn't the truth, it's not a fact, it's not the be all, end all of this is science, this is the this is the story, this is the only story we can tell about this coin. 
that's, that's, that's not how it is. Because the consensus is just where they overlap, where they intersect. But there's stuff over here and there's stuff over here as well that isn't going to be, that they're, they're just going to be totally different. This is the bell curve. Now we have the average stuff. Most people see this when they look at the coin. But there's some people down here at the edges who see totally different things. And the most colored glasses individual is going to see something fairly different from what everybody else sees. And if it's still true, it's still an experience. It's just an experience with a, a different filter, literally, in that case. Or you have someone who's schizophrenic and doesn't see, it, look, see the coin mutating totally. That's still a totally honest experience of the coin. It's just through a different filter, a different brain filter in that case. Um, so the, the truth is all of it. It's the full bell curve, or as, as my buddy speaker John Ash says, the hyperdimensional bell curve. Um, so there, there, there's all this fuzzy stuff on the outside. That, it's real. It's very real experiences of these things. Um, but it's not a consensus. The consensus part is the middle and in science, try to make sure to say that it's all of it. Reality is all of it. That's quantum physics. You know, everything that can possibly happen happens. Um, all experiences are true, but the consensus of this average sort of middling, objectified stuff is where we say that's the most likely description of this thing. Um, just being aware that there are other descriptions of it that are equally valid. I mean, some things are not valid at all because they're not actually experiencing this thing. You know, if I'm looking at there, the person who's turned around in a totally different direction, not experiencing this thing, then that's not a valid description of this thing. I mean, it's a description of not this thing, which is useful, but you know, it doesn't it doesn't help us in describing the thing itself, uh, unless. Suddenly this thing is also over here. Maybe this thing has a big string and it goes on over here and it's a puppet and there's something on the end of it that we didn't even know about. So turning around is actually useful too. So that's why don't ever invalidate someone's experience, someone's description of something if they're, you know, if they're really trying to be honest about it and they're, they're trying to tell you something about it. Um, you know, it's, it's useful information. Um, it's just a matter of just of understanding where, where they're looking and what they're looking at. And, how that is, relates to what everyone else is looking at. So this is science. This is comparing different things, adding perspectives, and observing, and not coming to conclusions, not saying be all end all, not you know expressing something. Science doesn't express something. Science takes in information, and tries to understand it, and makes models of things by comparing all of the different subjective experiences into an object of experience. Okay, so art, science. Science of this stuff. This is art and science. Origami, you have to research, you have to understand, you have to experiment how the different folds affect one another. It's topology. And you're starting with a flat piece of paper and you're making it into all these amazing three-dimensional or almost three-dimensional shapes, objects. So this is the science where you're experimenting and you're taking different perspectives, you're asking of the universe, whether that's another human being or the paper itself, you know, what happens when we do this? How can we make a shape that does this? So that's the science part of it, which is why I love this the art and the science coming together. And now how do we use art and science to get a better world? Well, there are two ways. Firstly, we use art to pull people towards a better future, kind of like a tour guide, but using emotional, expressive themes. So you have an idea of a future that you envision that would be better. Over there. We could go over there. It's nice over there. There's an origami puffer fish over there. We could go look at that. That might improve our lives if we do that. So, but we can use art to do that. And that's literally just speaking. Like I said, I mean, art is any medium, any expressive outpouring of sensory information. Any medium whatsoever. 
conveying to someone else something, an experience. I have a vision in my mind what it would be like to go over there. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that vision. Okay, if we go over there, we'll be able to see the little details. We'll be able to see the other side. We'll be able to spin things around and get a better idea of how you could turn a flat piece of paper, or in this case, probably multiple flat pieces of paper. I'm not sure, though. But we could find out if we go over there and look at it in detail. But we could figure out a little bit more about how you turn a flat piece of paper and folding it into intricate little shapes and turning it into a thing that looks like a puffer fish. Now, that was my art. That was my expressive sensory information that I offered you with my hands and my eyes and my words and my, and my emotions to attract you, to pull you towards a future that I would like to go to. So I'm telling you a story that's trying to pull you towards a central future that we could share. And that's a healthy use of art, is to pull people towards you, centralize, your experience towards something you think is better. Now science works the opposite direction. It's observing in a way that helps everyone go towards their individual better futures. So to diversify and to specialize. And we can use science to research what kinds of inputs we can give to individuals that will help them be healthier, help them be more positive, help them focus better on finding their passions, finding their creativity, finding you know what they actually want to do, finding some, some better future for themselves that will be different. I mean, maybe one of them wants to go over to the building over there, maybe another one wants to go for a swim in the swimming pool, and another one wants to go to the supermarket to get food to make lunch. And we can use science to help these people find their paths, find their unique better future, which is a, an overall better future for everyone, because once everyone else is doing what they love and following their passions and their dreams and doing good things, that they feel rewarded, you know, personally, internally rewarded for, that's good for everyone. So we can use science, in this case, to figure out what kinds of inputs, what kinds of things they need to be their best. So we look into the kinds of foods that help them feel healthiest, the kinds of clean air, the kinds of water, the kinds of information that makes them their best selves, that makes them be able to work towards their better future in their own unique way. So that's a pushing, that's a, that's a, a decentralized approach of science, using science to spread health, spread uh, an understanding of what makes each individual healthier. Now, there are negative ways of using science, and there are negative ways of using art. Negative ways of using science are using science and technology and information and understanding to harm people, to compete against them, to repress them, to kill them. That's not good. That's not going to make a better world. In a very temporary emergency situations, maybe, but not in the long term, and ideally, not at all, because we can always find better solutions. Again, except in very emergency situations. You know, for split second timing, sometimes you need to use technology to stop someone from doing something that's causing worse harm. Yes. But other than that, I mean, that's like absolute, you know, momentary things that shouldn't last more than you know, a few minutes, maybe hour, day max, kind of thing, whatever. Uh, so yeah, science, using science for, for negative, harmful, mm, please don't. However, using art to express negative things, negative experiences, that's okay. We do that all the time. We tell our stories with both the sadness and the anger and the frustration to the positive 
to the better futures. We start out saying, oh, I just broke up with my boyfriend. Or I just lost my favorite stuffed animal. Something. I just didn't get the volunteer position that I really wanted, that I so hoped for. This loss, this anger, frustration, depression, avoidance, you know, just all this negativity. That's part of our story and that's important. So telling that through art is great. But also, we can continue the story. We can continue the story saying, okay, this happened, this, this bad stuff happened down here, but now, now I have an idea of something new to do, something better. Now I want to go make a video. Now I want to go research cancer. Now I want to go bicycle around the world. I have a new idea based on this negative experience uh, to turn something into a positive experience, a better future. So negative art, fine, absolutely fine. Go for it. And also tell the positive art, tell the positive story, tell the world, share the world your your vision for something better. When you have that, don't force yourself. Don't force force yourself to take on someone else's vision necessarily. I mean, try it out. Definitely experiment. That's what science is. Me coming in here, looking at the art, is actually kind of a science because I'm observing it and I'm comparing the different things and I'm adding it to my experimental ideas of what art is. So absorbing art is kind of a science. But making art is the art. And observing it is also a little bit of art. Because you can interpret it in your own way. And so you can kind of create a new idea from the old idea and express it. By looking at the art from a scientific and artistic point and interpreting it and reinterpreting it to make art, which is also science because it's trying to understand what art and science are and how to better use them. So, art and science. Tell your stories, negative and positive futures. Pull people towards a better future with your art, with your expressive sensory information of your own experience. And then use science to understand how to input stuff into the individuals and kinds of food and water and all the stuff that goes into their, their bodies and their minds. Research what the best things are to help them be their best and have their own better futures so that we can all have a better future. What do you think? Let me know in the comments down below. Also, you can um, email me at thewiseturtle at gmail.com. That's T-H-E-W-I-S-E-T-U-R-T-L-E at G-M-A-I-L.com. You can also find my blog and podcast at turl.org, T-U-R-I-L dot O-R-G. Uh, and I would love to hear from you. And I hope you find creative and interesting ways to express your stories of a better future and also to find science and objective thinking, comparing different ideas and perspectives to understand what good things to put in your own body and other individuals' bodies to make them their best selves. Okay, leave you with that. Namaste.